Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, I welcome everyone and today um, we have our uh, guest speaker is Lawrence Tam, who has his CPA and CGA designation and he's a partner, a tax partner with Crow Mackay. And i just give you a bit of information about Lawrence. Um, he's presented for us before, um, and it was uh, very interesting and good information for, uh, for everyone. Um, Lawrence has over 16 years of experience in public practice with his primary focus on providing succession and estate planning, tax compliance, and planning to owner-managed businesses and high net worth individuals, as well as assisting clients with respect to tax audits and appeals. And today the topic is effective strat tax strategies. And I welcome Lawrence to go ahead with his presentation. Thank you again, Lawrence. Great, thank you. Okay, hey, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lawrence Tam and I'm a, a CPA child of professional accountant. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about the effective tax strategies to help you minimize the amount of tax you need to pay to the uh, CLA, the, the government. Um, we have about an hour or so together today. Um, you should all have a copy of the presentation, which uh, you can use uh, to follow along and take notes. Uh, this session is designed to be somewhat interactive. Uh, so please speak up if you have any questions, or maybe you can leave the question at the end of the presentation uh, for questions. Um, this session is presented by the Charter Professional Accountant of Canada, the CPA Canada. Uh, as you may know, CPA stands for Charter Professional Accountant. Accountants work with numbers to help uh, keep businesses honest and successful. Uh, CPA Canada is one of the largest accounting organizations in the world, uh, representing more than 220,000 CPAs across the country. Uh, Canadian CPAs are recognized and respected across the group for their knowledge and integrity. Uh, some CPAs work in accounting firms like myself, while others work in industries such as entertainment, sports, technology, uh, not-for-profit organizations, and many more. Uh, depending on their specific job, CPAs can be responsible for making sure a business financials add up, managing the budgets, and developing plans and policies that help grow the business. All right, so without further ado, uh, now let's get started. So today we are going to focus on more than, uh, on one of the inevit inevitable parts of life, which is taxes, and how you, you can develop an effective strategy that can help you minimize how much tax you need to pay. Uh, we'll cover the importance of understanding some basic tax law, uh, the need for proactive tax planning, uh, the three main ca categories for tax planning, uh, including the reducing income subject to income tax, uh, minimize, maximizing deductions, and using all applicable tax credits. We will also look at some other simple tips and resources that can help save you some tax money before we wrap up for a Q&A session. So it is important to have some basic understanding of the tax law and how it affects you and your family because the more you know about taxes, um, the more you may be able to save. So in contrary to many common or popular belief, um, the Canada Weather Agency, the CLA, does not does not create a tax law, nor are they the final or uh, or law, nor are they the final and absolute word when it comes to the interpretation of any given tax statute or tax provisions. Uh, instead, the Income Tax Act is the primary source of income tax law. Um, these laws are created by the Department of Finance, and the tax law are registered by the Parliament. The CLA, on the other hand, is a government agency that was formed in 1999 uh, to, administrate, to administrate the tax law. In the vast majority of the cases for the average individual taxpayer in Canada, there is little dispute over the interpretation of any particular tax law. And therefore, whatever the CLA published on their website or stay in their position on a notice, notice of assessment, can 
generally, I can't either re-emphasize, can generally be relied upon in the majority of cases. However, um, by understanding that COA is not the author of the test law, uh, but simply the administrator of the law, uh, there may be differences in how a particular tax statute or tax provision is interpreted by the CLA, and there could be some discrepancy uh, on the on the interpretation between the CLA and the taxpayer, uh, especially for more complex and ambiguous tax matters. For my past 16, 17 years of practicing in tax, uh, I, I have in fact seen many um, um, somewhat incorrect interpretation by COA. So do keep in mind that not all the time that uh, the COA interpretation of the tax law is accurate. So um, besides knowing the some basic tax knowledge, um, we should also be aware of our right. As we all know, tax law changes all the time. Um, um, this is some motivation from the government to make changes, including to meet the fiscal objectives, some political objectives or such shift in the government policies. So while changes can be tabled in the parliament at any time, uh, traditionally speaking, the majority of the proposed changes to the Income Tax Act or the tax laws are made through an annual budget, uh, typically released around March uh, in the spring each year. So that being said, uh, we should make sure to review the highlights after a federal or provincial budget is announced because oftentimes some new tax exemptions or tax credits uh, will be put, in, put into effect after the introduction of the new budget. Uh, also, any tax changes will be listed on the CLA website. Uh, we should also pay particular attention to the effective dates of these changes as some changes may be made retroactively effective and some are set for a future date. Uh, alternatively, if you have a relationship with your tax professional, um, consider asking your tax advisor about any new personal tax credit that may be allowed for any particular tax year. So in Canada, we have um, a um, tax bill of rights that is set of 16 rights confirming that the Canada Revenue Agency will serve the taxpayer with a high degree of accuracy, professionalism, uh, courteousness, and fairness. The tax bill of rights help you understand what you can expect in when you're dealing with, with the CLA. So you, you need to know your, about your right. For example, your right to privacy and confidentiality and the right to uh, a formal review or appeal if you disagree with the CLA. There is also uh, another organization called a tax or department called Taxpayers uh, Ombudsman. Ombudsman. The Taxpayer uh, Ombudsman is responsible for ensuring that the CLA will respect the service right outlined in the Taxpayers Bill of Rights. So in addition to understanding your rights, if a taxpayer feels that they did not receive the level of service expected, such as there's an undue delay of processing their return, uh, uh, poor or misleading information provided by the CLA or inappropriate staff behavior uh, received by the CLA, uh, by the CLA a, complaint, a complaint can be launched through the CLA service complaints program. Um, the objective of this program is to create a public awareness about how to file a complaint with the CLA and for the CLA to track and gather information throughout the process and to allow them to analyze any trends and identify any systematic issue. Uh, I'm gonna put down some contact information about all this uh, uh, organization at the end of the presentation. So how can we get a bit more resources about tax updates, et cetera. So the CLA website actually has a, a bunch of information on income tax and is a great place to start to get yourself familiarized with any most up-to-date uh, tax legislation or current tax update. Um, I highly recommend that we all stay organized throughout the year, not only to make the time, the tax time a bit easier for you, 
uh, all your for your accountants, but we'll also allow you to have access to all your organized information much easier so that you could focus on planning your tax strategies instead of focusing on collecting and gathering all your information um, to be just in time to file your tax return. And if you choose to prepare your tax return yourself, uh, make sure you choose a tax preparation package or software that would suit your needs. For a more complicated tax issue, you may want to uh, consider purchasing a more robust software that would um, uh, work well for your tax filing or tax filing preparation, or you may, you know, or you may consider hiring a tax professional. Um, when you choose to hire a professional, uh, make sure you evaluate that person's um, qualification and experience uh, to make sure that you find the right person uh, to prepare your tax return or provide you, or provide you with the tax advice. So there are some key considerations when we talk about tax planning. Well, the, the whole purpose of tax planning is to minimize your tax bill. And so therefore it's important to plan ahead and be proactive on the tax planning. The, the goal of tax planning is to, minim, to minimize your tax liability. Um, so it's important to plan ahead and do your research and lay out your plan to lower your tax liability in advance. So that being said, if you react to tax issue that has already arised or after the fact, then this is not an effective or proactive tax planning. And, and such acts would not give you enough time to put together a solution in place or to help you uh, to achieve some tax saving in time. Um, you should always consider your future income projections and, and your marginal income tax rates when it comes to uh, analyzing your tax exposure. Um, and I do also remember that when you want to do a tax planning for yourself or do a tax analysis for yourself, do keep in mind there as both provincial tax rate and federal tax rate um, that you did consider. Uh, and each province has its own tax rate and tax bracket. Uh, and we're gonna take a look at that uh, in the following slide. So as you can see from this slide here, there's two tables here. Um, basically income tax is based on a gradual scale system. Um, and of course there are federal tax rates and provincial tax rate. I know that on this slide, we're showing a Alberta tax rate only as a provincial tax rate. Uh, and for attendees, they may be coming from BC or living in BC, the BC marginal tax rate will apply to them. As you, as you can see that the, the, the lowest marginal tax brackets uh, for the federal marginal tax rate uh, will be at 15% for any taxable income earned up to approximately 53, 53, uh, thousand dollars per year, whereas the provincial, uh, Alberta provincial marginal tax rate uh, would be as low as 10% uh, for the first 142 thousand dollars of taxable income. And this would go up, this would go up. Um, if for people in living in uh, Alberta, um, the combined tax rate at the highest marginal tax brackets will be looking at 33 plus 15%, okay? that would come up to 48% in total. And whereas in, uh, for Western living in BC, the highest marginal tax rate will be, going, uh, will be as high as 53.5%, which is quite high because for every single extra dollar you earn, you might possibly be paying uh, more than half of your earnings to as tax to the government. So given the fact that we need to pay a lot of tax if, as you earn more, so what kind of tax savings um, option we might have? Well, the bad news is there are only two types of tax saving. One is called an absolute tax saving. The other one is called a deferred tax saving strategy. So the absolute tax saving approach, you know, um, by, the name of it, by the name of it, means that the tax can be saved and avoid completely. Uh, whereas the tax deferral approach uh, means that the tax are not immediately payable in the current year, but can be deferred or pushed out to some other future years. So therefore you could, in that way, you could kind of increase your current cash flow. And also for the time value of money, um, the later you pay your tax bill, the better because you could use um, the money on hand to do something else. Um, well, besides good news, sorry, besides the bad news, the good news is there are many ways to take advantage of these two types of tax saving. And we will go over some example uh, of both types of tax saving in the following slides.
excuse me. Um, so a great way to a good way to realize a absolute saving uh, in tax is through um, a tax fee saving account or TFSA. I'm sure many of you have heard of this or might have already opened a TFSA account yourself. Now the tax fee saving account, uh, although it's actually a money you put in, it's, sorry, it's the after tax money you put in to the saving accounts to earn tax fee income uh, through this tax saving account. Um, and the contribution amount you could actually contribute to this tax saving account uh, will depend on the annual prescribed annual uh, contribution limit prescribed by the government, currently at $6,500 per year. Uh, but the total contribution room you might have uh, will based on this formula on the screen, which is the annual contribution allowed by the government, which is $6,500 per year uh, currently, uh, plus any unused uh, previous year TFSA contribution amounts that you did not use, plus any total withdrawal in a prior year. Um, so just to one catch about this, which is the, the on the contribution amounts, the total withdrawal in a prior year, to, I'll give you an example here. If, for example, if you take away, sorry, you withdraw uh, $10,000 from your tax fee saving account this year, uh, you are allowed to re-contribute whatever you take out uh, in the current year in a subsequent year. Uh, so again, if in 2023, you took out uh, $10,000 $10, from your tax fee saving account, after December 31st of this year, okay, around the corner of the, of the new year, on Jan 1, 2024, you are allowed to re-contribute back this $10,000 uh, into your tax fee saving account. But the catch is you must wait until the end of the year. Otherwise, if you, for example, you take out that $10,000 in the beginning of the year and you, you put the same amount back to the plan in the same year, same kind of year, uh, uh, that may lead to over-contribution of your TFSA, which will be subject to penalty. So do keep in mind. Now, um, generally speaking, if you receive your notice of assessment after you file your tax return each year, um, the, on the notice of, uh, notice of assessment, it should also indicate how much um, uh, of your TFSA contribution amount uh, is for the coming year. So you can actually kind of rely on that uh, notice of assessment uh, to before you make your uh, TFSA contribution. You can also give your spouse or common law partners um, some funds to contribute to their TFSA. Um, making such contribution will not affect will not affect your TFSA contribution room, uh, but will allow your spouse or common law partner to maximize the amount of tax fee savings uh, you have as a couple. Okay, you might also consider opening a TFSA account for your children who are uh, at least 18 years of age. And do remember, if you, um, if you, uh, you, you, if you are going to make some transfer of, of a TFSA from one bank or one well, from one financial institution to the other, um, um, you don't 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 make this transfer through a ordinary withdrawal. Uh, because that way consider as a contribution or re-contribution in the same year. Uh, you really have to inform your, 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 ex your current bank and your new bank that it is a, simply a TFSA transfer between two banks. So as I mentioned earlier, this table briefly shows the available contribution maximum amounts that you could contribute to your TFSA. So as you can see, when the plan was first introduced back in 2009, um, the annual contribution amount was only $5,000. Uh, at some point in 2015, it got increased up to $10,000 per year. Uh, and then now it has gone back down to $6,500 uh, as for the 2023 tax year. So for any individuals who have never contributed to the TFSA, the cumulative amounts that that person can contribute uh, will be eighty-eight thousand dollars in total by the end of uh, the uh, by the end of twenty twenty-three. So next, we will take a look at a somewhat relatively new saving account, which is called a first home saving account. So a first home saving account um, 
is a registered plan uh, that allows a pros prospective first-time home buyer to save for their first home tax-free, up to a certain limit, of course. Um, the first home saving account, FHSA in short, uh, was relatively new. It only came into effect on April 1st, 2023, this year, really new. Now, you may be able to uh, save up to a $40,000 lifetime contribution limit, $40,000 tax-free, to buy a home with an annual contribution limit of $8,000 per year. Um, and to open a FHSA, uh, you must be a qualifying individual. And what that means is uh, you, must, you must be at least 18 years of age, uh, you must be a resident of Canada, and you must be a first-time home buyer. Now, do keep in mind that in some provinces or territories in Canada, the, the legal age to open a uh, first home saving account uh, could be 19 years, not instead of 18 years old. Um, and for the for the purpose of opening a uh, FHSA, you will be you will you will be considered to be a first time home buyer if you did not at any time in the current calendar year or 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 when you before you open the the account or in any of the preceding four calendar year uh, that you live in a qualified home as your principal residence that you own or you join it on with someone else. So pretty much is by us, meaning that you cannot PUSD own a, 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 a residential property uh, as a principal resident. Otherwise, you would not be considered as a first time home buyer, and therefore you won't be qualified to open um, this, uh, this saving account. Now, um, really similar to the RSP, um, uh, individuals who may claim an income tax deduction for the uh, first home buyer saving account contribution made in a calendar year or in a previous year, okay, uh, to the extent that, it, that, that such dedu deduction was not previously deducted before. Now, the, the, the maximum $8,000 contribution room can be carried forward one year, okay? Uh, so a bit different from RSP. RSP, you might have unused contribution room from many, many previous year, uh, from previous many previous year that can be a be accumulative and carry forward to future year for a, a much lump sum contribution. Whereas uh, for first home saving accounts, uh, you can own so far as, as the law permits, you can only carry forward one year of unused contribution to the subsequent year. So meaning that if in year one, you did not make any of the $8,000 allowable contribution, then you might make a total of $16,000 Eighteen eight thousand dollars times two years, sixteen thousand dollars um uh, first home buy saving contribution in the second year. But if in the, by the third year, if you still did not make any contribution in the first two years, then the first year unused contribution will be gone. Uh, you may also transfer your RSP to your uh, first home buy saving account. Okay, uh, however, any of this transfer amount from your RSP to your first home saving account is not tax deductible. Okay, um, the first home saving account also have uh, the deduction uh, attribute just like the RSP, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and, and also the withdrawal requirement is somehow restricted too. You cannot uh, simply withdraw the money out from your first home saving account um, tax fee, you could only withdraw that when you actually use the funds to purchase your qualified home as your first principal residence um, that you own or you will withdraw it on with someone else. So what type of uh, investment can you put in the uh, first home buy saving account? Well, generally speaking, anything that you can any any type of investment you are allowed to put into your RSP will pretty much be allowed for first home saving accounts such as a term deposit, CIC, mutual funds, bonds, uh, investment in uh, property trades, stock, etc. Uh, some people might actually prefer to run this first uh, home saving account under the self direct plan so that you can kind of manage your portfolio. Okay. 
Uh, but do keep in mind that there is a maximum participation period for this plan, meaning that that's a life for the first home safe account. Uh, and the life for that is uh, the maximum of, of time you could hold on to this, on this account is um, uh, either the 15 years since, the, the, since you opened this uh, saving account, uh, or when you turn the age of 71, or when you withdraw the money out for your first uh, qualifying withdrawal for your, uh, for, your, for your home purchase. So whatever comes first, then you have to close this account. Meaning that if nothing happened, you, you haven't turned 71 yet, and also you never really purchased your, uh, take the money out to purchase your first qualified home, uh, but the 15th anniversary from the day you open your first uh, uh, home saving account, you will have to close this account to avoid any negative cost, tax consequences. So another way to defer tax, okay, a deferred tax strategy is to um, consider RSP. Um, so um, as we all, I think we all know the RSP stands for Registered Retirement Saving Plan. Um, contributing to an RSP means that you are both saving for retirement and getting a current tax break. Any income earned within the plan is usually exempt from tax as long as the, the, the money will sit in the plan. Uh, it's ideal if you can set up an automatic monthly contribution um, uh, to receive the best return uh, instead of like putting a lump sum at the end of the year because you can then conducting interest and dividend from investment um, all throughout the year. Now, um, do, do keep in mind that even though sometimes you may not have any taxes payable on your tax return, um, you should still file a a, a income tax return because your RSP contribution room is based on um, uh, uh, the, the, the earned income you report on your tax return. So without finding a tax return, um, the CRA would not be able to confirm any new RSP contribution room for any particular tax year. Uh, you don't have, and also as we all know that any RSP contribution you make in a current year can be claimed as a deduction in a year. And so therefore, ultimately, you will also save some tax money on your tax return. However, that, that deduction is not mandatory. Uh, you don't have to claim the deduction in the same year you make the contribution. Uh, you have a choice to either defer that deduction claim in a future year or, or, or uh, uh, claim a portion of the current year contribution as the current year deduction and leaving uh, any residual amounts as deduction for some subsequent years. You may also want to consider contributing to a spousal RSP, uh, especially if your spouse's projected income on, on his or her retirement will be lower. Now, the Income Tax Act allows an, in, in any individual to contribute and claim the deduction uh, for yourself when you make the um, spousal uh, RSP contribution. Um, now, the Income Tax Act also requires that anyone who holds an RSP account and when they turn the age of 71, um, the, 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 any, any funds sitting in the RSP account should either be withdrawn out completely or it can roll into a uh, registered retirement income funds or the REF. Okay, now once the money gets rolled into a REF, then on an annual basis, there's a minimum amount of withdrawal that you need to take out from the REF um, from that time onward. If you're wanting to buy or build your first home, you can also borrow up to $35,000 tax-free from your RSP under the home buys plan. Uh, and any amounts that got pulled out from the uh, RSP for the first home buyer plan, under the first home buyer plan, uh, will have to be repaid uh, over the next 15 years. Uh, or uh, they, if without repayments, then the, the income will be uh, so the withdrawal amounts will be considered as income for that year. Uh, under the RSP, um, you could also uh, consider the life lo uh, lifelong learning plan that allows individuals to withdraw funds from the RSP to finance their training or application either for themselves uh, or for the spouse or common law partner. Um, the amounts that 
pick out from, that's taken out from the uh, RSP for the lifelong learning plan needs to be repaid over the next 10 years. Uh, and you could withdraw up to $20,000 from your RSP for the uh, for under the lifelong learning plan. Um, and the $20,000 withdrawal is up to $10,000 per kind of year or uh, $20,000 in total. Uh, okay. Next, we will take a look at the uh, some other example for deferred tax saving. Uh, and we will look at the RESP, the Registered Education Saving Plan. So the RESP is a good way to save for a child's future education. Uh, and because this would actually allow um, them to have a saving part aside for their future education. Now, any, any money that earned with the RESP plan is also tax-free, okay? Now, there's some terms that I want to quickly uh, define here before we, 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 before we discuss a bit further about the RESP. Uh, the first term is called subscriber. The subscriber is actually referred to the person who makes the contribution to the plan. Um, the term promoter, uh, basically, the, the, easy, the easy way to put this is the bank or any financial institution you, 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 you have your RESP, RESP plan with. And finally, the beneficiary is the person um, for whom the plan will be set up, uh, and the beneficiary must be under the age of 21. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, any, and any, any income earned through the RSP plan is tax-free tax uh, or tax-deferred until the money gets pulled out by the beneficiary uh, for the beneficiary um, education or training purposes. So this tax deferral is actually also, to some extent, a uh, some tax saving because when the money got pulled out from the RESP plan uh, for the beneficiary uh, application, usually at the time the beneficiary, the children, um, will be at a much lower marginal tax rate. So when the money actually received in their hands, they, they either will pay zero tax or a really little income tax. Excuse me. Now, however, different from RSP, or the uh, uh, tax saving, uh, ta uh, the home first home saving account. Um, any contribution to any contribution made to the uh, our ESP plan is is not is not tax deductible to the contributor. Okay, uh, um, and, um, uh, and 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 however, however, the government actually have a um, say, uh, education saving grant program. That will provide up to twenty percent of your uh, of your first twenty five hundred dollars of annual contribution, uh, or up to a, a lifetime maximum seven thousand two hundred dollars grants provide to the plan. So, for example, if you contribute two uh, two thousand five hundred dollars uh, uh, to your RESP plan each year, then you will have received about five hundred dollars, which is twenty percent of the RESP contribution as a grant from the government, and that that grant can be used towards the, the, the beneficiary uh, future education. So uh, really high level, um, the, the, goal for, the goal of any tax planning is to minimize your tax liability. And every taxpayer in Canada um, has a right to arrange this kind of uh, tax planning or affairs in such a way that minimize the liability as long as it is within the, the, the boundary of the Income Tax Act, okay? So as long as not doing anything illegal, you're allowed to do tax planning. Um, planning ahead involves years and tax planning. So uh, use the last few months of the year to look ahead at your future tax needs. Then there may be opportunities for you to uh, plan your income so that you will be taxed at a lower rate or claim any deduction expenses in a year when you anticipate that you will be in a higher income tax bracket. Uh, it may also be um, uh, a tax beneficial to defer any income to a later year uh, or, or accelerate any deduction in the current year. So um, typically speaking, there are three types of uh, uh, income. One is called a capital, capital income or capital gain. Um, usually, uh, and the capital gain will only be taxed at half of the portion of that will become taxable. Um, another type of income would be the interest or the ordinary income, such as employment income. For interest and ordinary income, this type of income will be taxed at the, at the full ta module tax rate. 
Uh, and finally, uh, there are also dividend income. Dividend income is a bit more complicated. Um, dividend income is a, 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 a residual profits that, that coming out from a corporation. So at some point, the corporation will pay a tax first, and any remaining retained earning can be paid out as a dividend to the shareholders. So the, when the shareholder receives dividend income, the, the shareholder will also receive some something called the dividend tax credit. So overall, the dividend, the tax rate on dividend income will be lower than the, the tax rate for interest and ordinary income. So um, again, really high level, you did you did define your goals, uh, what you what you're looking at, uh, what you what you anticipate and foresee your income will be in the coming years. Okay, uh, we view that at the at the year end and look at to to ensure that all deduction and credits are taken appropriately. Uh, the overall objectives in tax planning is try to defer income or uh, or increase or increase expenses or increase the deductions. And when you try to achieve some tax goals, keep in mind there are three fundamentals. Um, um, one is to lower your gross and taxable income. Um, two is to to take all allowable deduction as possible. And three is to use all available tax credits for you. Now, deferring income to another year is the same as decreasing your current year's taxable income. So you should consider the timing of your capital gain. For example, if you think that, hey, I'm going to have um, 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 less income next year, maybe I should consider of selling my capital puppy next year instead of current year. Because by selling more, uh, cap, uh, any capital property this year, that may trigger capital gain that may actually push you to a higher module tax bracket. Um, and, uh, and also by consider taking any deductions um, in, the, in the current year as opposed to the future year or vice versa. Again, uh, some discretionary deduction will be, as what we mentioned earlier about the RSP deduction, you might have make RSP contribution in the current year. But again, the deduction, the claim deduction on RSP contribution is, is discretionary. You could take a deduction in the current year or in the future year. That also depends on your expected or projected income uh, for the coming year. Finally, you should always maximize your tax credit. So you should know what kind of tax credits are out there. Some really common tax credit may include um, a medical tax credit, uh, donation tax credit. Um, uh, some um, uh, and other independent dependent uh, tax credit, uh, etc. And we're gonna go over them in the next slides in more details. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, when you make an RSP contribution, your tax saving will be affected by the current expected tax rate. If you expect to be moving into a higher tax brackets then you, you may benefit from deferring your RSP contribution or the deduction from the RSP contribution you want to claim to a later year. Uh, you should also consider of structuring some, some plan that will allow you to generate some tax deductible interest. Okay, so for example, if you are going to um, um, borrow some money out from your uh, home equity, um, to for, uh, for 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 investment, any interest coming out from that uh, loan should be deductible against your um, investment income. Wherever possible, you should also consider splitting income with your spouse. Okay, although that income splitting strategy is not always allowable in today's tax rules, uh, so a special a special or careful planning is needed. Uh, you should also consider of um, um, uh, trying to be coming out flat on your tax return, meaning that um, not only that you should not having a lot of a uh, tax refund. Uh, of course, you also don't want to have a lot of uh, tax payable. If you expect that you will be making up uh, have a tax payable on your tax return, consider of making some tax installment upfront because any shortfall on the tax payment on your tax return may actually trigger a um, serious uh, interest charges. And these days, the interest rate is really high. The, the COA uh, uh, interest rate on uh, unpaid or underpaid um, taxes is currently at 9% annual rate compound interest. 
however, on the other hand, if you think that you don't need to uh, pay too much of a tax upfront, um, you might, for example, talk, talk to your employer and fill out a form to reduce any uh, source withholding tax from your employment in income. In this case, you don't have to be sending in too much of the tax upfront to the CLA. Um, so this slide here will show the different types of income that attract different tax rate. As you can see from this slide here, uh, ordinary salary and interest income are taxed at, um, uh, at the rates that you probably are familiar with. You will see that the capital gains are taxed at half of the rates of the ordinary income, such as employment income. And finally, you will see that the dividends income are taxed at a different tax rate as well. And the, and the tax rate for dividend income is generally lower than the ordinary income, such as employment income. And looking at this table here, um, some problems clearly have um, a much higher rate than the others. Uh, for example, you look at the problems of BC, the highest marginal tax rate for interest and regular income is at 53.5% uh, as, compo as compared to, um, um, say, a little bit of Yukon, um, uh, the highest marginal tax rate is, is well below uh, uh, 45%. So depending on where you reside, um, do keep in mind that if you move from one province to the other, um, your tax rate would depend on where you reside on the last day of that tax year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as an employee, there are real limit, limit limitation on how you could lower your taxable income uh, because there are really strict, the really strict limitation on the type of expense you can claim. Um, uh, however, you can choose to defer some income and capital gains to later years wherever, where, wherever possible and try to accelerate any discretionary expenses or loss to the current year. Um, for example, perhaps you could redirect uh, those funds into investment or retirement saving plans. Uh, when you eventually report this deferred income, uh, you, you, may, you may be in a lower income tax bracket and pay less tax. Um, uh, you can also defer some discretionary expense of deduction, such as, our, such as RSP contribution, um, to, uh, to a later year when you expect that your income will be will fall under a, a higher marginal tax bracket in, 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 in those years. Um, another option of tax planning is to consider income splitting. So, excuse me, um, the option available to you, to indiv the individual for income splitting, uh, to some extent, is quite limited as well. Um, uh, um, however, uh, one area where income can be split without having to worry too much about uh, any ne negative class consequences is to um, is is that in, in Canada uh, you are allowed to split your Canada pension plan or in the province of Quebec your your QPP Quebec pension plan with your spouse by transferring up to 50%, half of your income that is eligible for the pension income credit. Uh, so you and your spouse, uh, however, must jointly file an election to split that, 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 that pension income. Okay. Um, however, it is recommended that you talk to your tax advisor uh, before you do any tax planning on splitting your pension income with your spouse or common law partner. Uh, we can also use some investment tax planning strategies, such as um, uh, the tax loss selling strategy to maximize the use of your investment loss. For example, if you have a puppet trade um, uh, series on hand uh, uh, and you trigger some loss in the past, that loss can be carried forward indefinitely to offset any future capital gain or any loss in the current year can carry back three, up to three years taxation year back to offset any capital gain that you may have uh, triggered in the past three years and, and trigger refund.
Um, some other expenses that you could consider of taking, it will be if you have um, vehicle expenses, for example, um, a, a, a taxpayer who are self-employed, they might need to incur their vehicle, ex uh, they might need to incur vehicle expenses um, to, to, to earn the self-employed income. Then these kind of vehicle, motor vehicle expenses can be claimed as a deduction against the self-employed self income. Um, we can also consider donating public trade securities to charity, and that would also uh, trigger a donation tax credit um, to overall reducing your tax bill. So before we move on to tax deduction and tax credit, I want to clarify the difference between these, these, these two terms here. <laughs> So a tax deduction is an amount that will reduce your taxable income. So for example, you're looking at this table here. If your income is $100,000, but you have a tax deduction of $1,000 and, and you're at a marginal tax rate of 37%, the tax saving from claiming this, this tax deduction will be $370. However, on the other hand, if you could claim a tax credit of $1,000, the credit itself will give you a refund or reduction of your tax bill on a dollar for dollar basis. So clearly, if you could get a tax credit, which is clearly is much more beneficial to having a tax deduction because tax deduction is only to reduce your overall taxable income and you will only get the difference based on your marginal tax rate. Whereas the same amount of tax credit, uh, you will actually get a dollar for dollar tax benefit. So uh, now we can take a look at a look, closer look at the tax deduction here. Um, some deduction that we, we oftentimes will come across of will be childcare expenses, moving expenses. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the RSP and uh, FHSA contribution. Uh, you could also claim a deduction on interest that was incurred to earn investment income, okay, or uh, used to, 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 to put in investment. <laughs> Some other deduction may also include union of professional dues. Uh, now, uh, do, do, do keep in mind that uh, in, interest deduction on borrowed money is, is sometimes is relatively restricted as well. So the, the rule of thumb is the interest must be incurred to earn income from business or from property, such as you, earn, you have to borrow the money to buy, let's say, a rental property, so therefore you'll be rent, you'll be earning rental income from the property. You might be uh, uh, borrowing money to 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 invest in stock, which would turn into uh, a capital gain or dividend income to you. So this kind of interest, this kind of investment or interest related to this kind of investment will be will be deductible. Okay. However, interest on loan that is for all other purposes, such as you you might have to incur interest on uh, a, a, a personal mortgage to purchase a personal uh, residence, that does not need to any income, uh, earning of any income, then interest on such a mortgage will not be, deduct will not be deductible for, for tax purposes. Next, we would like to uh, take a look at the, um, take a look at some of the common, you come across a uh, tax credit. Now you will see that I put, uh, and out and n out in brackets for the tax credit, the refundable tax credit versus the non refundable tax credit. So, with the high level, a refundable tax credit is any tax credit that you are entitled to and will refund to you, regardless whether you need to pay tax or not. Whereas the non refundable tax credit means that you will only be able to claim the tax credit if you have a tax payable. Okay. So some of the non-refundable tax credit will be a charitable donation tax credit, meaning that if you make a charitable donation in the current year, but overall you don't have any tax payable on your tax bill or tax return, then you don't get the you don't you don't get to claim this charitable donation tax credit. However, the good thing is you carry um, the, ch the charitable donation to the next five years. Uh, so for from so you could actually come uh, claim more than one year of uh, duration in the subsequent year up to the uh, up to up to the up to five years. Uh, other tax credit we could look at uh, would be the Canada Dental Benefits, the Medical Expense Tax Credit, 
uh, the child disability tax benefit, tax credit, um, uh, the Canada Care Gift Credit, tuition tax credit. Uh, again, the tuition tax credit can also be carried forward as well. Um, uh, and also other interest uh, credit on interest on student loans. Okay, now the interest of student loan, uh, it, the credit itself is not, not, not transferable. However, it can be carried forward for five years. If, for example, the student in any particular year does not have any taxable income because they're student, <laughs> so then they don't have any tax payable, then this non-refundable uh, tuition, uh, student loan tax credit, interest, interest on student loan tax credit can be carried forward, um, uh, can be claimed in, in, uh, within the next five years. Uh, and a few more other tax credit, uh, but these are all non-refundable tax credit, may include the Canada Workers' Benefit, the Warranty of uh, Firefighters, Pension Income Amount, the Canada Employment Amount, Home Buyers Amount, and Adoption Credit as well. So some, some tips here. Um, just a reminder that all of the individual T1 or personal income tax return. Uh, and if it has any bonds owing at Dune, uh, they are all Dune and filed by, must be filed by April 30th or the following year. Um, you should always file, try to file your tax return on time to avoid any late filing penalty uh, and, and, and serious arrears ar interest. Um, you should file, you should also just file your, uh, your, your, your tax return for your family member and you keep in uh, to keep track of any care for amounts, as I mentioned earlier, some amounts you can care for it for over uh, five years. Uh, for 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 RSP, record state uh, we have saving saving plan, you have option of when to take the deduction of the contribution. Okay, uh, any amount that you contribute in the current year may 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 be deducted either in the current year or in the future year. Uh, do you keep to keep your notice of assessment available to, to review your RSP contribution limit for the next year. Um, uh, uh, because oftentimes when you go to the bank, the bank would not know how much RSP contribution room you might have. So therefore, uh, by referring to the, no, the, to the assessment notice that you receive from the COA uh, for the most recent year that you file your tax return, that should give you an idea how much RSP contribution you might, you might make for that year. Any over any over contribution will be subject to uh, a penalty and interest charges. And as with any personal financial matters, uh, keeping details records is really important uh, as, it, as the burden of proof is actually with the taxpayer, not with the CLA. So part of your plan should include the steps that you will take to gather and maintain your records. Okay, this includes that you should have a good record of your bills, uh, back of, uh, some backup documents, your credit card statements, your expense receipt. Uh, you should also retain uh, your stock transactions, uh, any housing or, uh, or business uh, uh, or rental property expenses records. Okay, um, so, uh, so and you should, you should be doing this on a regular basis instead of waiting till the end of the year. Uh, so that would act, you know that would actually save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle when you when you are getting close to the filing deadline of a tax return. And as I mentioned earlier, here are some uh, useful resources you could consider taking a picture, or I I'm sure that you already have a copy of um, this PowerPoint presentation slide. Uh, so you could always refer to these online resources provided by the COA. Uh, if, uh, to get familiarized with the tax law or any tax update. Uh, I think that's just it. That's kind of wrap up my presentation for today. Um, and I now open for um, um, questions. Um, and just want to put a disclaimer notice here. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, the the main thing I heard you mentioned several times is to stay organized throughout the year with your taxes, along with of course there's along with all your other great tips. But uh, like no more uh, collecting things in a shoebox and taking them to the accountant. Like if we can stay organized, it really helps, and um, I can attest to that. I uh, I need to be more organized as well. Um, 
I did have one question from uh, one of our participants that wanted to know if they could have your email. They had a specific question about taking money out of their RRSP. So, um, with uh, yeah, 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 I'm more, I'm more than happy to uh, share my email address uh, with all the attendees today. Um, so, um, I think the best way maybe um, they could email you and then you could sh share that with uh, with the okay. with anyone who needs that, that email address yeah okay and um we didn't send the slides ahead of time but we will oh. send them after my apologies for that um, no everyone did get the questionnaire so um i know that's helpful for lawrence if uh, you can fill that questionnaire out and i don't see any questions in the chat unless any oh here comes one um Oh, is there a maximum age for the FHSA? Maximum age? No. Yeah. So you could, depending on the promise you 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 you, <laughs> you live in, generally speaking, generally speaking, either eighteen or nineteen is the legal age you could open that uh, first home saving account. Um, there's no age limit. However, do keep in mind that uh, you 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 must close your um, F saving home saving account um, uh, either at, at the earliest time of the following uh, either it, it first hit its 15th anniversary or um, when you turn the age of 71 okay. or when you after you pull the money out to uh, for your for your, for, your first, for for purchasing your qualifying home so so again there's no no age limit um uh all time limit but however if you let's say you are already at the age of uh 69 then you maybe only have about a couple of years before you need to close this uh uh, uh saving account yeah okay i think that answered the question so if you're mm -hmm. in your 70s uh it's not a good time to open one that's right that's right um here's another question should you be taking tax off your CPP or OAS, OAS. You'll be taking tax. Well, when the government give you the sort of taking tax or CPP, I, I I believe that um the question is asking about should there be any tax with withheld on the pension that we receive from the government? I assume. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, I assume that's that's the question. Um, uh, so again, anytime when you receive some kind of a government benefits or, uh, or, or, or subsidy, um, generally speaking, the, the government would have already calculated any reporting tax on the amount. Uh, the pension income the CP itself should have some reporting tax on it. Uh, however, um, the, the, when you, when you prepare a tax return, if overall your annual income, let's say fall below a, a threshold, I think now the basic exemption is about 50. Approximately fifteen thousand dollars per year. If, so, if somehow that your uh, your 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 integrated or your all your income fall below that 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 basic personal exemption amount, then you will get any withholding tax uh, back as a refund. Okay, good. I've got another question. If an sure. FHSA is closed because the holder reaches reaches the age seventy one, mm. is the amount in the F <laughs> HSA account taken into income and taxed. Uh, yes, because when you when you take it, when you take it out again, any any amount in in uh, uh, no uh, uh sorry uh so the 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 income you put in there because you could it's be treated as like an RSP as I mentioned earlier the contribution you you, you amount you put in there we assume with your RSP. You can take a deduction. So therefore, yes, when you take it out, it will be considered as a taxable income in the year you 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 take it out because you also had the advantage of fund to to claim a deduction when you make a contribution. Yeah. Okay. But but again, generally speaking, you would pull it out um, for 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 uh, let's say because of the uh, age of seventy one. Hopefully by that time you you, you could be at a, low, a lower module tax bracket. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any more questions. So I just want to thank you so much, Lawrence. I really appreciate you putting in your time uh, for TB Vets and for um, all of our participants. Thank and you're you. Welcome. You're yeah. welcome.